It's a privilege to be here. I just want to say thank you to Pastor Chris and Pastor Caitlin for inviting us to come today. And it's just such a privilege just to be anywhere for God and do anything that God calls us to do. Um, I want to take a moment just before I begin here and just kind of brag on God a little bit. And I'm going to get started. But how many of y'all believe that God is still doing miracles today? God's still in the miracle business. You know, a lot of times we think of miracles as being, you know, miraculous healings and legs being extended and cancer and all that stuff. And those are all healings. But I believe everybody, every time somebody gets saved, that's a miracle. When somebody surrenders their life to Jesus Christ, that's a miracle. The Bible says in Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Then the Passion Translation says, Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all, for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. My wife and I experienced this this week. I have four children. And um, looks like God's kind of got my wife and I uh, with prodigals. All my kids seem to be prodigals. My two oldest sons are serving the Lord. I have two daughters that aren't that 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 aren't that weren't saved. And we were eating with my youngest son Joshua and his wife Haley this past week. This is the first time I've publicly said this in, in public. It would have been in Covington. I would have shared it this morning in Covington. And we're having uh, dinner with my with with my son and his wife. And Joshua can't get the grin off his face. He just can't stop grinning. And Hale is like, Hale is like telling him, don't say anything. And Joshua couldn't help himself. And Joshua's telling us that they talked to my daughter, Hannah, who wanted, he didn't want anything at all to do with God, nothing at all. They talked to Hannah and said, you're not going to believe Hannah's saved. H Hannah is like completely turned around. I'm telling you, it's a miracle. And I, I told, and I, I never doubt God. And you know, it's like we pray for these things. And it's like, but when it happens, we're always shocked when God does it. And it's like, and I'm talking to Joshua. And I'm like, Joshua, I got to see it for myself. I got I to I gotta, I gotta see Hannah for myself. And my wife and I met with her later on this, this past week. And I'm telling you that she's completely different. She, she's talking different. She's thinking different. She's acting different. Her countenance is different. Her attitude has changed. She is completely 100% saved in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, God is in the miracle business today. God is doing miracles. And I, I'm, I always pray this when I pray for salvations. I pray for a Saul-like experience. Because when God touched Saul, nobody was there witnessing to him. Nobody was there preaching the gospel to him. The only thing that touched Saul was, was Jesus. The Holy Spirit touched him. And I pray that. And that's what, what happened. But y'all probably know this verse of scripture in Galatians. Um, Y'all know Saul was the persecutor of the church. He hated he hated Christians. He was he was arresting Christians. In Galatians chapter one, it says, and this is him speaking. It says, "I assure you before God that what I am writing to you was no lie." Then I went to Syria and Sicily. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. That's Jesus. That's the, the church was blown away that this man that was trying to kill them and persecute them was now defending the faith he was trying to destroy. So I just want to encourage you today that God is alive. God is on the move and miracles are still happening today. Amen. And I'm just so excited. I, my wife and I, we, we, we thought we were dreaming. I, I, we got home. We, she handed, we, she, we, we met her at our house. So we dropped her back off at the house and she got into her car and left. My wife and I walked inside, we closed the door, and we just looked at each other, we didn't know what to say. This is like we're completely speechless. But I'm just I just want to encourage anyone out there, if you're a if you're a mother or a father, God's in the business of calling back prodigals home. I believe that I that, that that's what God does. He calls prodigals. Lee was a prodigal, Joshua was a prodigal, Hannah was a prodigal, and I'm believing that God's gonna touch my daughter Michelle as well, that God's calling her back home in Jesus' name. So praise God, but that, that's good, Cody. Thank you so much for doing that. And again, I just want to say what a privilege it is to be here this morning speaking to y'all. And, um, you know, this is my hometown. For the, Many of you may not have, know who I am or have ever met me before, but um, I grew up in Shamet. Um, I was born in New Orleans, and uh, my mom and dad moved down to Shamet when we were two years old. And 
If you give me about another five or ten minutes, you can be able to figure out where I graduated from by the way I'm talking and by my vocabulary and all the other kind of stuff. But, no, I graduated from Shaman High School in uh, 1983. And we, we were still, it was still uh, all boys, and it was separated, you know, just all boys school and all girls was Andrew Jackson. And um, some of y'all are probably thinking right now, and I, I do this from somebody speaking, if somebody mentions a, a date, you're trying to figure out how old I am right now. I know, I know some of y'all are probably doing that. 1983, 2021, figuring all this stuff out. But anyway, we grew up in Chalmette, and um, so it's a privilege just to be back home at no, but you know, I've always considered myself just to be ordinary. I consider myself to be anything special, just 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 ordinary. And like those who saw Peter and John in the book of Acts, it says when they saw their courage, they realized that they were just ordinary, un uneducated men who had been with Jesus. Jesus makes the difference. You may not think of yourself as being anything special, but you and Jesus can do extraordinary things. And that's what I've always thought about myself. I've never thought of myself as being anybody special, anybody important. But I feel like if, with me and Jesus, I'm pretty special in God's eyes. And that, that's how God sees us. So, um, you know, I just want to share just a few things real quick before I dive into the message. I just feel compelled just to share this with you all this morning. Um, you know, the, the, these are some of the principles that have kind of guided me and kind of led me to where I am today, and they're, they're, they're basic, simple things, but I believe if we grab hold of these things, that you, it'll really take you into another level than you walk with Christ and with God. And the first one, the first principle is serving. It's serving. Jesus Christ said, I didn't come to serve, but to be served. And um, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. And so we need to follow the example of Jesus Christ, that God just wants us just to serve. So I would just encourage anybody in this church today, just, just partner with Pastor Chris and Pastor Caitlin and say, you know what, if there's an opportunity for me, just put your hand up and say, I want to serve. That's me. If the door's open, that's what my wife and I has always done. Any, any place we've ever been, we've just always looked for opportunities for God to just open up doors, and I just made myself available, and I said, I just want to serve. And you'll be amazed how God will take you and elevate you to other positions. The other principle is the principle of brokenness. You know, the Bible says a broken and contrite heart, God will not despise. And um, I, I find a lot of times, and I know in my life, God uses brokenness to teach me things. And usually before God is going to use me in, a, in, in any capacity or any certain way, brokenness usually precedes whatever it is God's about to do in my life. So I would just say allow God to, if, if, if you're going through a tough time now and God's maybe showing you some things or whatever. Just, just let God do his work. Let him cut you. Let him break you. Let him change you. Let him do whatever it is he wants to do. And let, just let God have his way in shaping you. And then the next one is humility. You know, the Bible says that pride, pride comes before a fall, but humility comes before honor. And um, just humble yourself before God. The Bible says that Jesus humbled himself. He, he, he became a servant, the Bible says, and the Bible says God gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So just, just, just be humble. We're not, we're just vessels. I tell my church, I said, I'm just, a, I'm just an instrument. I'm not anything special. I'm not anything great. The only greatness in me is Jesus Christ. So I just counted a privilege just to be a vessel. I'm just a vessel. I'm, I'm a spokesman. God has given us the word, and I'm just, I'm just standing as a vessel saying, God, I'll speak your word. I'll do that. But um, I believe if you, if you grab hold to those principles in your life, then I believe that God can do mighty things in your life. Amen? Amen. So, um, so how many of you know that it's not, it's not how you, it's not how you uh, start something that matters. It's how you finish. You know, a lot of times we can start a lot of things. You know, you can name a lot of things in your life that you probably started, but I bet you many of those things that you started in your life, um, you never finished. And I'm not sure about this, but I think it was the year that the Saints went to the Super Bowl. Chris can correct me on this, but Sean Payton had a motto for his team, and he called it Finish Strong. I don't know if it was that year. It might have been one of the years that was after that. But one of his big mottos to his team was, was to finish strong, like we – we're in a game, fin finish strong. We're in a season, we're in a season to finish strong. And um, I think that's extremely important for us to grab hold 
of that concept. And um, I was thinking of a story that happened to me when I was younger, and hopefully it was really young. I don't remember exactly how old I was, but, but it was a summer camp that we, we were at, and um, they were doing like some competitions, some swimming competitions and some different things that you could sign up for. And one of them was an underwater swimming competition where you got into the pool and see how far you could go underwater. And I said, I, I think I can do a pretty good job swimming underwater. I'll, I'll sign up for that one. So um, we, we got into the pool and I jumped in and I, I started swimming. And man, I'm, I'm in there swimming. I said, man, I know I'm just got to be like, <laughs> I'm going further than anybody else. And so I popped in my head about the water, I looked around, and I was basically in the same place where I started. And what I did, instead of getting in the water, going forward, I was like going down. <laughs> so in other words, I was going, I was going down, and I was holding my breath, but I wasn't, going, I wasn't going forward. And I came back up, and it was basically in the same place that I started. But, but I believe that God today wants to plant something in your spirit that will keep you going the distance. Because that's really what God, that's really... For us as Christians, God wants to see us finish the race. It's not enough just to start the race with Christ. God wants us to finish to the end. Many of you are probably familiar with the parable of the sower, and this isn't going to be my main text, but the parable of the sower, Jesus gave the analogy of a farmer, which was Jesus or which was God. And the analogy that Christ gave was the farmer had the seed, which he scattered to plant his crops. And Jesus used the analogy as the farmer planted the seed the seed landed in four different places and those four different places represented four different people that that received that received the word of God and one of the places that it landed was on the path and if you read the parable Jesus explained that it was someone that heard the word of God but they didn't really understand what it was they were hearing they never really received what it was that they were hearing so they they didn't last the second place was the was the rocky places this is the one that received the word of God, but the Bible says they tried to live for God all at once. But because they never had any root, they weren't grounded, they didn't go very far. Then the third place was the thorns. This was the one where they hear the word of God, but the worries of life, the cares of life, the riches of this world, all these different things choked the word out, and that person didn't last either. And then finally, this, the last seed that landed was in the good soil, the Bible says. And the Bible says that seed landed in a place that produced fruit, that was, that was productive, that was fruitful. And the Bible says that that, 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 that that good soil really was the heart. It was the heart of the person where they received, where they received the word of God. So I could believe you, you could argue that that parable tells us, I believe, that every one of those people were saved. They, they received the word of God. They, they, they accepted the gospel. They believed, they believed the message. But they didn't continue the race. They, they, didn't, they didn't press on to finish, to finish their race. Only one, only one finished. So for those of you who have, who have received Jesus in this room this morning, you have started your race. You started the race with Jesus Christ. So I want to tell you congratulations. But really the work has just begun. The work has just begun for you. And that's really where the battle takes place. And the Bible uses a lot of analogies of, of the Christian race. It talks about contending for the faith, fighting for the faith, all the different things that we're going to come up against because there's going to be adversity. There's going to be things that are going to come against you in, in, your, in your Christian walk. So to remain faithful to the end, you're going to have to have some principles and some fundamentals that you kind of grab onto in your walk as a Christian that's going to sustain you. So as I'm looking for things in my life that I can grab onto, that I can say, God, I need something that's going to keep me all the way to the end, something that's going to cause me to stay and remain faithful to God. And I believe today's message is one of them. And um, so many of you are familiar with the exchange that took place when Jesus was arrested. If you read the Gospels, there's a lot of accounts that, of, the, of the, the, the things that took place when Christ was arrested. But one of them was when Jesus was brought before the Roman governor, uh, Pontius Pilate. And, and if you read the exchange, Pilate was very curious to know why it was the Jews had arrested Jesus. So was they, the, the Bible says when he did his, uh, when, when, he, when he talked to Christ, he could find no, no grounds or no reason at all for them to want to execute the man. There, there was nothing at all that he could say that this man did wrong. But if you read, it, read the exchange that, 
that Pilate had, he was extremely curious to know what it was that the Jews had arrested Jesus for. And, and during the exchange um, one, in the Gospel of John, um, I believe it's one of the most profound questions in all the Bible that, that Pilate asked. It's found in John chapter 18. It says, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, retorted Pilate with no basis for a charge against him. Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? And that's the title of my message this morning is, what is truth? And I think that's very, it's very telling that Pilate asked that because I don't think Pilate was asking Jesus what was truth to find out the definition of what was right or what was wrong. I have to assume that Pilate understood what telling the truth was or what, what truth was, but there was something in Christ that I believe frightened Pilate in the sense that when Jesus said, when, when, when Jesus used the word truth, it, it frightened Pilate in such a way to want to know what is truth. In other words, what, what is that? And I believe that that really, that really opened his eyes up. So I'm convinced that the revelation of truth will keep us the race. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. In John 8, 31 and 32, it says, To the Jews who have believed him, Jesus said, If you teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. See, if I'm going to surrender my life to something, I want to know that it's true. I don't, want, I don't want to surrender my life to a lie. I want to know that it's true. So why does it matter what we believe? You might be sitting here, you, might, you, may, you may have joined this church, or you may be coming to this church, and you may not have ever, really ever asked yourself the question, why does it matter what I believe? This is what my parents have always done. I've just happened to go to this church, and it's happened. Does it really matter what I believe? Yes, it does. Especially if you're going to give your life to it. If you're going to surrender your life to something, then, then, then it's extremely important that what you believe is true. It, it is the truth, and for me, that, mean, that, that means a lot. And uh, I was reminded of a story when I was preparing for this one. My wife and I, we lived in Violet in Oak Ridge subdivision during the time of Hurricane Katrina. And I remember I was there. The garage was in the, was in the front of the house with the driveway and had the door open. I think I was in the, in the, uh, in the garage just, just doing something. And some Jehovah's Witnesses came by. And I'm in the garage. And it was a lady, a couple of ladies. I think I don't think there was any men. But there was a couple of ladies that came in, and they had some small children with them. And um, normally I don't really say a whole lot. I'm just kind of like I'm not interested, but God just kind of like, you know, you need to say something this time. So they're coming in, and they're giving their spiel about, you know, what they believe and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I always tell them, you know, that G Jesus is Lord, to, you know, to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if been, had any experience with the Jehovah's Witness, they, they cheat. In other words, if, if, if I want to debate with someone the Bible, then let's have the Bible the same. But what they've done is they've changed the Bible. They, they, they've changed their verse of Scripture where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. They changed that to say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with a God. In other words, to say that, say that Jesus Christ wasn't the only God. He, was, he, he wasn't equal to God. But anyway, we, we're, in the, we're in the garage, and we're just kind of talking and, and, and I basically told her, I said, I, you know, I, I'm a Christian. I, I've confessed Jesus Christ as Lord. And she had those small children with her. And the whole time God kept telling me that that, 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 is, that that is so wrong what they're doing to those children. Those children don't have a choice. In other words, as a parent, my obligation is to teach my children what the truth is. That they're going to follow whatever mama and daddy does. And I told her, I said, you know, you're wrong. I said, you, you, you said you're leading those children into something that is not right. It's false. And those children have no, they, have, they, 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 they do not have the right to, to, make, to, to make their own choice and their own decision. And so it just reminded me of how important it is, especially for us as parents, that we are living the truth. And I'm not going to ask my children to believe in something that's not true. I'm not going to ask them to give their lives up 
for something that is not true. So, so we, we need to understand it's extremely important what we believe. See, millions of people are believing in a lie. You know, some people say, well, you know, that's impossible that everybody that, you know, maybe the Buddhists and, you know, you know all, these other, all these other religions, there's no way that they could be wrong. Yes, they can. It, it doesn't matter how many people it is that, is that is following a certain religion or a certain teaching. If it's not the truth, it's a lie. And uh, so it, it, it doesn't matter how many people it is that's doing that. In Hebrews chapter 11, um, it says, Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might be given, so that they might gain even a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and floggings, even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. I'm here to tell you, those people did not suffer for a lie. They knew that whatever it is that they believed in was the truth, and they were willing to die for what it was that they believed in. It's extremely important to know why you believe what you believe. It's not just something you just say, well, that's what I've always done or what, what my parents have always done or what. No, what you, we have to know why it is what we believe. So before I look at defining the meaning of truth, I believe it's helpful for us to understand what truth is not. And this is extremely important for us to get this. Truth is not a religion or a denomination. You could be a religion, like the Jehovah's Witness, which, which, which is a false religion, it's a cult, but you could be a religion or even a denomination and not necessarily be speaking the truth. Just because you're a religion, you, you can automatically assume, well, that, that's the truth. Truth is not what the majority says is true. That, that, that's the catch. That, that's the hard part of Christianity. That more than likely, if you're a Christian in this room today, the place where you live or the place where you work, you are probably one of the only people in that place that serve Christ. I know that's how it was for me when I was in the secular world. I, what does the Bible say? We are strangers and aliens living in a place where we really don't, I don't belong here. I don't fit here. This is not my place. I'm in the kingdom of God. But God has left us here to be the salt and the light for the salt and light for the earth. But it's not what the majority says is true. Truth is not simply what is believed. And I'm going to look at that in just a second. And truth is not a feeling. This, this, this is extremely important for us to grasp, especially in our, in our charismatic uh, uh, churches that we, that we connect with a lot of times. It's important for us to not connect truth with a feeling. So what, what's the definition of truth? And I think this really kind of will open up your eyes here if you look at this. A lot of times when you're studying the Bible, it's important to take a word that's the English word and go back and find out what was the meaning of that word and the original word that it was given, in, whether it was in Hebrew or whether it was in Greek. Hebrew would, would be, would be the, uh, the Old Testament, and then the Greek words would be what's written in the New Testament. So you, you get a lot of depth and insight into what the meaning of a passage was or what a scripture was if you found out the original meaning of that word that, we, that, was, that was derived into English. So this, this is one of them here. But the Greek word for truth is aletheia, which literally means to unhide. And that word up there should be uh, or, not of. I got that wrong. means to unhide or hiding nothing. It conveys the thought that truth is always there always open and available for all to see, with nothing being hidden or obscured. The Hebrew word for truth is emeth, which means firmness, constancy, cons consistency, and duration. Such a definition implies an everlasting substance and something that can, be, that can be relied upon. The truth is the reality of the way things really are. Tr truth is something that stands the test of time, that, that stands firm, that, that is unmoved. And when I was Reading the Greek definition of the word truth, I thought of Jesus Christ. And what, it, what does it say? It's something that is unhidden for all to see. Jesus Christ lived his life in public. Jesus never lived his life in private. He did, everything in, he did everything in public. Christ was humiliated and was suffered and died in public, the Bible says. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ was the truth. So we first need to understand that truth is a person. 
truth is Jesus Christ is the truth. He, he, he is the truth. Jesus' words, his actions, his teaching, he, he was the perfect in its, in its untainted form, in its purest form, truth. When you look at Jesus Christ, everything about truth exists in that one man. Every word that he spoke, every deed that he did, every action that he had, everything that he taught, Jesus Christ represented the way things really are. He was the truth of everything. And that, that is so important for us, for us to get that. The Bible says that Jesus came to show us who God the Father was. In the book of Hebrews, it says Jesus was, he, he is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. In other words, if you looked at Jesus, you saw God exactly the same. He represented exactly who God was. So if someone ever wanted to know, how could I ever know God? How could I ever really know who God the Father was, who, who the Creator was, the, the man that created me, the, the, God that, the God that created the universe? How could I ever know this God? Look at Jesus. The Bible says he is the exact representation of God's glory. He is the truth of who God, who, of who God really is. See, Jesus gave us the perfect truth of our Creator. Before Jesus came, the, the, the Bible tells us that God spoke through the prophets. But now the Bible says in these last days, God is speaking through his son. See, God is speaking everything through Jesus. Why? Because Jesus represents the truth. Jesus represents the heart of everything that God is. But, you know, you think about this. Before Jesus Christ came to the earth, the world had never really seen what truth really was. Truth had never really walked among us. It never spoke to us. It never gave us an illustration of what truth really looked like to Jesus Christ came. And all of a sudden, Jesus Christ came from heaven, not from man. And the Bible says Jesus Christ walked on the earth among us. And everywhere Jesus went, he was giving us a picture of what truth really was. The reality of life. The words that he spoke. The, the Bible says when the people heard Jesus speak, they said, we've never heard anyone speak like that before. Never seen the miracles that Jesus Christ performed, the way he taught, the way he acted, the way he loved. We were getting a perfect picture of what truth really was. In its purest form, Jesus Christ represented truth. He gave us the reality of sin, of mercy, of grace, of, of heaven, of hell, of forgiveness, and of love. He was perfect in every way. So how does this truth impact us? What you and I believe is not true because we believe it. Even if I don't believe it, it's still true. And this is, a, this is so important for us to understand this. I can't just say that because I believe in Jesus Christ, that makes it true. That, that, that's not why it's true. It's true whether you believe it or not. It, it, it's true whether, whether, or not you, whether or not we believe it or not. You, a lot of you have heard the phrase, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, I got a better one than that. God said it, I believe it. I mean, God said, God, God said it, that settles it. In other words, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. If God said it, that settles it. That, that's the truth, whether or not you believe it or not. So if someone were to ask you, and I told my church this, if someone were to ask you, why do you believe in, why do you believe in Jesus Christ? Or why do you believe in the cross? You, you, what, is your, what does your church believe? Or what do you believe about salvation? Or what do, you, what do you believe? A lot of times our response is, well, this is what my church believes. Or this, or, or, or this is what I believe. And the person that you're talking to, they might, they might say, well, this is, this is what we believe. Well, what happens is you can walk away from that conversation and both of you can walk away feeling that both of you are right. But guess what? Only one of you are right. The one that believes in what God says. So we can't have a conversation or a debate with someone about, we can debate with someone about the truths of the Bible, but I can't walk away assuming that what they believe is right, what I believe is right. Only God's right. Whether, whether they believe it or not, it doesn't matter. So that's extremely, in other words, you got to stand firmly on the, on the truth of the word of God, that, that no matter what anyone else says or thinks or says, it's the truth. It's the truth of what God says. This, um, I had a conversation with someone that I used to work with before I 
became a pastor and I was, God just impressed upon my heart. I need to go witness to this man. And so I took him out to lunch and we were having lunch and I just started witnessing to him and sharing the gospel. And he was real polite. We, we were still friends to this day. We get along great, but he didn't want anything to do with what I was saying. Didn't believe in Jesus, didn't believe in God, all those different things. Didn't want anything to do with it. And I told him, I said, look, I, I, I still love you. I said, That's, we weren't arguing. It was, it was completely open. But at the end of the conversation, I looked at him and I said, I just want you to know that what I am telling you is true. Whether you agree with it or not, whether you believe it or not, I just want to make sure I leave the conversation like this, that what I'm telling you is the truth. We have to be that firmly rooted in what it is that you and I believe in. See, truth doesn't need to be defended. I don't need to defend truth. Truth does a great job standing on its own. There was even if you don't defend truth, truth's still going to be standing there. It's, it's never, what did it say? It's firmness. It's unmovable. It's never going to be moved. Truth, truth's always going to be standing there. So we, we can debate in the sense that, that we, want to be, we want to be respectful with someone else's questions or, or uh, their curiosity or whatever. But I don't debate in the sense that they're going to change what I believe about what the truth of, wor of the Word of God says. They're not, that, that, that's not going to change. I'm not... I'm not debating for them to get to convince me that what I believe is not true if it's what the Word of God says. This is, this, this is another, I believe, a, a practical illustration of truth in action. And Chris kind of touched on this a little bit when he was talking about worship. And I was reminded, you know, we, we, we were in this church. My wife and I joined this church about five years before Hurricane Katrina. And I grew up in a Baptist background, a Baptist denomination. So spirit-filled churches. Holy, Holy Spirit, all those different things. The, the Baptist denomination really never operated and acted in the, in the gifts of, of the Spirit, gifts of healing, laying on of hands, all those different things. And when we came to the church, you know, that was all brand new for me. But, but, but the, the, the presence of God and the Spirit, Spirit of God was so real in this place that none of that stuff mattered to me. It, it didn't matter. It's like I knew that God was real and God was going to show me all those other things. But but when we talk about worship, worship and praise, you know, we, we, we come into this room on a Sunday morning. You have to ask yourself, why, why do I worship God? Why am I worshiping God? Some of you might come in and you might think, you know what? I don't feel like worshiping God today. I, I had a bad week. We argued on the way over here. The kids were bad. They're cutting up. I'm in a bad mood. I, I just feel bad. You know what? I'm not going to worship God today. Well, it doesn't work like that. I don't worship God because I feel like worshiping God. I worship God because of who he is. In other words, regardless of what, how you feel about it, whether you understand it, whether you agree with it, you come into this church and say, but I don't, I don't really like, you know, the, the words, whatever. We, wor we worship God because of who he is. It's the truth of what the word of God says for who he is. The Bible says in Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. I worship God because of who he is, not because I feel like worshiping him. It's not, it's not about what is this church doing, what does that church do. No, I'm going to worship God because of who he is. It's based on truth that he is Jehovah. He is the one and only God. He is creator, the God of heaven and of earth. So I just want to encourage you today. And, you know, Chris was kind of encouraging you all to worship and raise your hands. And I remember when we, when we joined the church and at the, at the time when we came, it was the Assembly of God Tabernacle, and then we later on changed the name to World Prayer Tabernacle, and now it's the Tabernacle Church. But again, the Assembly of God, that was a brand new thing for us. And we sat about right there with Sister Dorothy sitting right, right up in that area there, and they had a, they had a man that, was, that was, stood kind of in front of where I was, and he was kind of, kind of a big guy. He had, he had big hands, and every Sunday we'd come in for worship, and I'd sit right behind him, and he had both of his hands up. And, and I mean, just just had him up and I'm just standing behind him. And the whole time I'm like, I want to do that. Like, I want to have the courage to, like, raise my hands. I, I just want but I, I had never done it before. So it was just I guess I was intimidated or I just couldn't do it. So finally, I built up the courage and I said, you know what, God, I'm just going to I'm going to get one hand up. <laughs> I'll get one hand up. So I started like that in a couple of weeks or whatever. I just I had one hand up and all of a sudden God just said, you know, what? you need to get both hands up. And I got both hands up, and I'm telling you, it was so freeing. It was so liberating. You know why? And Chris, Chris gave a good analogy, but you know what God showed me when I did that? It, it, it was a picture of surrender. 
Because what do you do when you, are, when you get arrested by a police officer? What does he tell you to do? Put your hands up. Why? Because you're surrendering. You're surrendering to him. Well, guess what I'm doing when I'm raising my hands to God? I'm surrendering to God. I'm surrendering to him. So I want to, look, you're free in this place. I, the, the tabernacle ministry, there's freedom in the house. That you're not, you're not hindered in any way here. So that, that, there's, no, that, there's no shame. There's no intimidation. G- get free in Jesus' name and tell God. The Bible says lift up holy hands. We're not doing anything that contradicts what the word of God says. I, I'm worshiping God. And you say, well, I wasn't raised that way. I don't. It's true. He's Jehovah. He, we, we are worshiping the one and only God. I'm going to raise my hands. I'm going to jump. I'm going to shout. I'm going to sing. I'm going to do all those things because of who he is. So you need to get that in your spirit. It's the, it's the truth of who God is. Then we understand that you, you were saved by truth. The Bible says that salvation is found in no one else. There's no other name given under, under heaven by which we must be saved, the Bible says. That's what the word of God says. That, that's what the truth says. See, your salvation may have been an emotional experience, and, and that's okay if, if you came in tears or God may have really, really touched you in an emotional way. But what happened to you was not based on feelings. It was based on truth. It was based on truth. So what we have to be careful is, as Christians, we don't allow, we don't allow emotion to guide my Christian walk. Because guess what emotions does? They go up and they go down. So if I'm basing my Christian life on emotions, what's going to happen with me as a Christian? I'm going to be up and I'm going to be down. And and if I stay down too long and I think that, you know what, maybe God, maybe this God stuff ain't real and maybe this Jesus stuff wasn't real, guess what I'm going to do? Eventually I'm probably going to slide away and I'm going to be out the picture. But if you are basing your life on truth, it doesn't matter what I feel. It doesn't matter what's happening around me. Cancer could come, death could come, sickness could come. All these everything, the world could come to an end. But guess what? Truth still stands. Jesus Christ is still true. Salvation is still true. Heaven is still true. Hell is still true. Eternal life is still true. you got to base your Christian walk on truth. Emotion is not going to carry you. And I'm speaking to young people here today, or maybe, maybe you're a young believer in the Lord. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not speaking against emotion. E- emotion is a good thing. That, 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 that's evidence, I believe, that God really touched you. But that's not going to sustain you. E- e- emotion is not going to keep you. But guess what's going to keep you? Truth. It's true. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is my salvation. That is true, and that's never going to change. That's never going to change. That is so important, so important for us to get that. See, when Saul met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he said, he said, who are you, Lord? See, for the first time, Saul realized that this Jesus that he was persecuting was Lord. He recognized the truth of who Jesus Christ was. And after that, it was over with. Saul's life life was completely changed. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, it says, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. God's word is going to stand forever. It it doesn't matter what comes to you. I don't care what happens in politics. I don't care what happens in the U.N. I don't care what happens around the world. The truth of who Jesus Christ is will stand forever. God's word will never change. It will never fall. It will never fade. It stands true. Hold on to the truth. That's why I said you got to go back to what I asked you in the beginning. Why does it matter what I believe? Well, it, it, it matters a lot because if I don't really, if I'm not convinced that what I believe is true, I'm not going to stick with that. I'm going to run. I'm going to fall back. You know, I think about that when I look at Christians and they, a Christian gets saved and somebody was serving Jesus. They were loving the Lord and all these different things. And maybe for years and all of a sudden, they're not serving God anymore. And I have to ask myself, well, what happened? All of a sudden, hell wasn't real and heaven wasn't real and the cross wasn't real. What happened to all of that? That never changed. You did. God never left. You left God. Hold on to truth. If you don't hear anything else today, if you're listening to me this morning, hold on to truth. Don't, don't sit here this morning and think that, well, that'll never happen to me, that I'll never walk away. I, that, I'm telling you, I could, I could name so many people that love God, serve God, were plugged in, and all of a sudden, I don't, I don't even know where they are now in God. Truth will sustain you. It's true. 
It's true in Jesus' name. See, feelings and emotions come and go. See, some days you wake up, you don't feel like loving Jesus. You don't feel like reading your word. You don't feel like, let's be honest. I'm being, I'm a pastor. I mean, sometimes I don't feel like reading my Bible. Sometimes I don't feel like praying. But that doesn't mean, does, does, that, does that mean it's not real? No. I need to pray. I need to read my word. I need to worship God. I need to do all of those things because that, because that's who God is. See, when the music stops and the emotion disappears and all my friends have forsaken me and doubt begins to flood my mind, truth is still going to be standing. Truth is still going to be there. God's never left me. God will never leave me or forsake me. God loves me. God has called me. God has chosen me. God has saved me. Begin, just begin quoting scripture. See, this, this atmosphere that we're in this morning, this is easy to serve God here. Let's be honest. This is it's pretty easy here. You know, we're worshiping. We're all, we all look nice. Everybody's happy and all that kind of stuff. The hard part is out there. <laughs> that, that, that's where the hard part is, is to really stick, to stick with Jesus and serve, and serve Jesus. Josh McDowell wrote a book called More Than a Carpenter. I would highly recommend that book. It's a small, just a small paperback book. But in the, in the book, he, wrote, he, wrote, he posed a question. He said, who would die for a lie? Who would die for a lie? And he he was sharing the uh, the the evidence of the the evidence of the of the resurrection. And one of the things that he that he gave as evidence for the resurrection is that all the apostles, with with, with the exception of course of, of of Judas, which betrayed Christ, and then the apostle John, all the apostles, if you read other writings, they died martyrs. There was a, they died they they were willing to die as a martyr for Jesus Christ. So the point that they were making in the book was. Who would die for a lie? In other words, it, it would be one thing if, if the apostles knew that Jesus Christ wasn't resurrected, that, that they knew, and they said, you know what, I, I really know that he really wasn't resurrected, but you know what, I'm going to go, and I'm going to go let him crucify me anyway. I'm just going to suffer just because I want to. That doesn't happen that way. They knew that Jesus Christ was resurrected. They had, they had seen it with their own eyes, and now they were willing to give their lives as a as a sacrifice, they were willing to literally give their lives as borders because they knew that what they had believed in was true. The Hebrew word for truth is zemeth, which means firmness, consistency, and duration. It's everlasting. Truth, truth is never going to leave. Jesus Christ is the truth, the Bible says. And then Psalms 139 says, So you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So you are affirmed by truth. So some of you in here this morning, maybe you've never had any affirmation of mother's affirmation. Of, I never had affirmation when I was growing up. I had one of my teachers one time when I was in middle school. She called me a blooming idiot. I deserve that. I'm not going to tell you what I did for her to call me that, but if I told you what I did, you would say, you know what, you're a blooming idiot. You, you deserve for her to call you that. But I never, I never received any affirmation from, from even from my, my parents. They, they loved me. They were there for me. I, I, know, I know that they cared and they were there, but there was never any affirmation. And some of you could be in the same position. You've never had anybody really affirm you and tell you, you know what, you're beautiful or you're special. Or you're created uniquely in the image of God. No one's ever said that. Well, guess what? That's what God says. See, that's what that's what truth says. The word of God is truth. So I'm I'm affirmed by truth. The word of God affirms who I am because it's God the Father, God the Creator, speaking into my life. The Bible says, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is who we are. That's the truth. You might have ne never known a mother or a father, but the Bible says if you are in Christ, you are his son, you are his daughter. That's what truth says. That's what the word of God says. The Bible says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Not, not to harm you, but plans to prosper you, to prosper you, to give you a hope, to give you a future. That's one of the things that Hannah told my wife and I. And when we, and I'm telling you, it was like talking to another person. It was literally like we were speaking to someone we never met. 
We don't know who you are. We never met you before. But Hannah looked at us and she told us, she goes, she goes, guess what? I have a future now. She said, I have a future. She gets, she, she understood that. See, she, she saw how the enemy was robbing her of everything. Now she said, I got a future now. And now she's declaring the truth of who Jesus Christ is. She's telling her friends. I'm telling you, words cannot, words cannot explain it. If, if, you, if you could take a picture of my wife and I, we, we were speechless. But God's not a respecter of persons. I'm not anything special. I take no credit for that whatsoever, except that we were on our, I'm on my knees every morning praying for my children. And we, we think, well, sometimes, you know, we pray and that's not enough. Prayer's, prayer, prayer is big. That's big in God's eyes. The devil tries to make you think that praying doesn't matter, but it does. So God's real. The truth, Jesus Christ, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus himself was the truth. He's true. Might not feel like it. Sometimes you don't understand it. Don't see it. Don't get it. Don't like it. Doesn't matter. It's true. And there's only one way. His name is Jesus. There's only one gate. There's only one door. There's only one way to get to the Father. That's God's invitation to everyone in this room today. Some of you may, you may have felt the knock of God's hand on your heart, gently knocking on your heart, calling you. Hannah said, she said that. She said, I, I know there was times when God was, God was knocking, but I resisted. I, I, I just didn't open the door up. But I knew, I knew, I knew that God was calling me. There may be somebody in the room here this morning that, and I'm just going to ask everybody just to stand to your feet as I close here. There may be somebody in the room here this morning that God, God's knocking on your heart. And, and you've never surrendered your life to God. You've never, you've never, you've never confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord. The, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All really what the prayer of salvation really is, is this. It's simple. It's this. Jesus, I need you. Because guess what? You need him. I need him. You, you need a savior and God's here and God loves you and you might think well you know what uh, you know I'm young uh, I got my whole life ahead of me I'm gonna and I'm gonna live you got to read the Bible you got to read the Bible Jesus said we're not promised tomorrow I can't brag about tomorrow I don't know what what's gonna happen tomorrow Jesus said live for, live for him today I don't know who that is in the room today but but what I am speaking to you is truth. What I share with you today is not a religion. It's not a denomination. It's not what David thinks. It's not what David thought up. It's true. It's the truth. But God is not going to force himself on you. You have to willingly open up your heart, open up your life. And you have, the Bible says, to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the sons and the daughters of God. We got God, God, God's, God's invitation is there, but I have to receive him. I have to open up my life and say, Jesus, come in.